so quick caveat, I'm actually uh, no longer part of Bing. I'm work going over to the large, large data learning sets, but I still have a lot of knowledge about it, so I'm happy to talk about it at length. Also, this is not an official Microsoft stance. What we'll talk about today is more of a how do we get out of our own way? How do we stop ascribing everything to vendors and ascribing everything to what companies are doing and look instead at, look instead at what it, what's coming from all vendors, what's coming in the industry generally? So we'll talk more, in a more, more general fashion, I think, than uh, uh, just one particular vendor. So uh, the thesis, as, as we talked about a bit, is uh, this coming age of search will look nothing like that which we know today. That's the main thing. And why? It's not just because we're trying to push the envelope, trying to create new models of search. It's because the underlying fabric that search was based on, meaning the web itself, has fundamentally changed. And why and how? This is how. This guy on the left. Not just this guy, but all of us in this room who look kind of like, eh, most of us look like this guy on the left a little bit. Uh, and it, it really comes down to them being uh, constantly connected. So we see Chris in the audience here. Where's Chris at? I just saw him. He's not here now. But Chris is, is constantly connected. He's emitting literally millions of signals in a, in, in a given month or in a given, in a given week. What's happening is the world is now born digital. The world no longer is an analog thing we then translate into digital uh, factors. The, we produce things in digital. The fact that we have uh, the drop cams in our houses or in our offices broadcasting out to the web, uh, the vessel cup right there, which will actually monitor what you're drinking and, and, and tell you the, the composition of what you're drinking, report that back to a system, all these things, the little tiny, little tiny embeddable sensors you have right there, which you can weave into your clothing, they have all sorts of different types uh, of information about you. All these, these little tiny things actually create this world around us, help us remodel the entire planet around us in a digital fashion, which is very different than it was, say, five years ago, where we would, or 10 years ago, where we would produce something in analog. We'd paint something, if you're a painter, we would write something, we would uh, take an analog photo and maybe scan it, and if we get lucky, that's all pretty much gone. Yes, there are still folks who paint, thank God, and there are still folks uh, who take beautiful pictures on wide lux cameras, uh, that guy in particular. Uh, but, but, but generally, the means of production today is digital. And of course, we also have all these services that exist now as well, these services that connect the physical and digital worlds in interesting ways. So as a result of all this stuff, uh, that we have now created so much data, it's almost meaningless. This even is probably out of date. This, this changes so quickly, it's hard to comprehend. Uh, but the world today uh, is creating about four zettabytes of data per year. And what does that mean? It means nothing to even those of us in computer science. It means not a whole lot. Um, but what it actually, if you, if, you, if you break it down, it's about uh, 133 billion 32-gig uh, iPads per year worth of data we're creating. And if you took all those iPads, and stacked them all up, you would actually create the equivalent of about four, or about three Great Walls of China. That's how much data we're going to create this year alone. And the terrifying thing is, it's going to double next year, and the year after that, and it has for, for the last several years. What's fun about that, of course, is that we now have this rich tapestry of data to pull from. And Gil, at the end of the day, I think we'll talk a lot about this as well and how he's making sure that they can capture all these, all these points of data. Uh, but it is, it is a, it, it's a fascinating uh, thing to think about because never before in human history have all these different data been available for machines to do something with. Traditionally, all the information that was being created, like that was stored in your address book or stored maybe in your own phone or stored somewhere else in an offline fashion, today more and more that this data is being, is being stored in the cloud, accessible to crawlers, accessible to different systems to, be to begin to make sense of it. So what's happened as a result? We've got the real world now being described in ridiculous amounts of detail that the computers can now use. So you can't see the words here, but this is a desk, uh, obviously. I hope it's obvious. And around that, you see all these different factors. You see where the wood was sourced from, who assembled it, the country of origin, the weight, uh, what the designer said about it, the dimensions of the desk, and all different types of formats. This, this data is now all available about that particular object. And what's fun about search these days is that we're able to look across the entire rich web that exists out there and cobble together or, or, or pull together all these factors that uh, can, can reconstitute that physical object inside the digital realm. At Bing, we had a thing called the Knowledge Repository, which did this. It would, as the indexers were out there scrubbing the web, finding all the different information about the web, they would begin to reconstruct the physical world. So by the end, and when I left, uh, there were 33 billion objects inside that knowledge repository. 
And it's not just the fact that they were there, it, it, was, it was the connections between things. So we knew that a desk went in a house, or a desk rested on a floor, or a wine bottle was served in a restaurant, and all these sorts of characteristics. So it was much more than simply being a great index for the real world. It was really a digital proxy, a very, very high definition proxy of the physical world stored to digital means that, again, systems can do something with. And that's very exciting uh, to me because it opens up an entirely new notion of search. Whereas before, search is all about keywords or mapping a keyword to a set of URLs or mapping a keyword to a, a business's website, that kind of thing. Uh, now, search can be much more proactive and smarter and functional because it understands the world in which we all live, not just uh, the world that was represented by words on a text page. So it's very exciting. Uh, what's... Uh, the point, what's here, there we go. We've gotten now to the point where I, I can ask search really interesting questions. They, as I mentioned, they, they're now able to make sense of this, of this raw data to understand the, the, the actual world. But you can ask, I mean, you could, you could theoretically today ask a search engine, uh, uh, why can't I put this cat in a shredder? Horrible question, obviously, I know that. Uh, but, but traditionally, if you ask a search engine that question, it would give you 6.6 .6 million links about putting cats in shredders, and mo mostly it wouldn't be that. It would be the fact that the word shredder and cat was somewhere on the same page, and maybe there's a graphic somewhere with a cat, and we would return back anything we could, we could do to make you believe that we had all the answers in the world. But because now machines are, search engines are now smart enough to begin to understand what a cat is, what a shredder is, uh, why you wouldn't want to do that, because if you do that, they would bleed, and ble blood loss leads to death, and death is a bad thing generally. All these, these, these kind of predicates of knowledge that we as humans have, the machines now have. So the, your ability to uh, actually have, have these conversations with the search engine and, and have them understand the real world uh, is a lot better. In fact, a couple of buddies of mine down at Google, uh, they're working on, um, it's not advancing, they're working on a bunch of systems. One of the systems they're working on uh, was their, their ML, the machine learning system. Uh, and uh, they, about, about a year ago now, I guess so, it was maybe a year and a half ago, I guess, uh, they were working with the systems. And, and suddenly, what happened was the systems began to understand things uh, about which they weren't programmed. Meaning that the faces they would show the systems, Google could actually, in, in, inside, don't worry, not outside, uh, inside, inside the indices, were able to actually figure out what the faces were without being explicitly told. That's a huge shift. Traditionally, in, in modeling, and computer science, and, and data science, you'd have to go and articulate the different features that existed on, a, on an object or a document or anything else it might be to be able to say, this is what a face looks like. It's got a protuberance here. It's got two eyes here, two kind of darker holes here. Uh, it's got some kind of opening here. And you have to describe this mathematically, at least not using words. And that's how machines could figure out, when they looked at something, what it actually was. The innovation or the advance, I guess we want to say, is that suddenly now, in the last year and a half or so, the machines themselves have begun to, to, to think, and, and it's a bit of a strong word, but to, to teach themselves about the world without them being explicitly programmed. And that, that obviously opens up uh, an entirely new chapter for how we think about search. And it leads to what looks like machine intelligence. It, look, it looks like artificial intelligence. It really isn't. It's still something called machine learning. And I think you'll hear about that a little bit today as well. But machine learning. Uh, this is Vino Kosala, one of the kind of famed uh, inventors of, or uh, founders of Sun and now a quad venture capitalist. But uh, his, his theory is that machine learning will have a bigger impact on humanity than the mobile revolution has in the last 20 years. It's a pretty profound statement when you think about it because that is a, a big shift. Mobile technology has done a lot for us in the last 20 years. And he thinks ML, machine learning, will be bigger, uh, bigger uh, certainly, than, than mobile. And what is ML? I mean, a lot of you folks in the room probably know what that is, but for those of you who haven't been keeping up with your IEEE spectrum uh, reading material, uh, machine learning is pretty much the thing that allows Amazon to tell you what you might like. Uh, it, it helps uh, your cell phone understand what you're saying uh, when you curse at it or when you talk to it. Uh, it helps really take all the data that, that's out there and recognize patterns within the data. In essence, what it really does is, is it makes machines look like they're thinking because it can, you can show them a bunch of, uh, bunch of very uh, complex and icky data, and at the other, at the, at the, at the other end of the uh, uh, machine learning pipeline, it will actually show you what that data really means. And really what it comes down to is uh, machines saying, if I see this pattern enough times, this is likely what will happen next. And that's the very exciting part, because suddenly now you get into a predictive model 
uh, where you can predict all sorts of things. You can predict what customers will do when they come to your site, when they come into your store, uh, how they find you, all these sorts of things that we long for as, as humans, that the kind of the, the quest for future knowledge uh, can now be done with machine learning. It's much the same way that we, uh, as kids, learned what a ball was. You know, you have maybe, uh, when you were a little kid, when you are a year old, a year and a half old, that's how we kind of acquired this notion of the world and how we acquired uh, the notion of language. You'd see something round on the floor, uh, and it would be bouncy potentially about that size. Maybe it's red or black or blue or something. Uh, and, and over time, your parents would walk by, your friends would walk by, and they would point to it. They would say, ball, or get the ball, or watch out for the ball, or make sure the dog doesn't eat the ball. But over and over again, you as a child would, would see this thing on the floor, and you would see people pointing at it and, and referencing it with some word, not in that case, ball. And uh, over time, then you acquired that knowledge. That was a ball. Uh, it's the same thing with machine learning. Basically, show a machine something enough times, you give it some hints about what that thing is, and over time it can recognize what that thing is going forward. Uh, except it has, instead of your parents and your friends pointing at it, trillions of inputs to learn from. So it's a very exciting uh, time because we suddenly now have the data required to allow machines to use machine learning to figure out what the real world is. So we've given uh, systems or search systems a, a brain but we've also given search systems a bunch of other types of human senses. So it's not just the fact that they can now, again, without freaking folks out, think for themselves. It's the fact that they can now interact with us in more natural, humanistic ways. So for example, you've got uh, things like the, the vision. Computer vision is now fairly common. Face.com, which is an Israeli startup a few years ago, uh, got purchased by, by Facebook. Uh, and that allowed them to, in essence, recognize faces uh, from across the web. A lot of research is happening there as well. You've got, so we've given our, our systems the ability to see things. We've given our systems the ability uh, to hear things. So even old school things like Shazam, it's still a very remarkable piece of computer science. The fact that it can listen to some ambient noise and figure out what it is you're listening to as a very exciting uh, kind of advance. We've given the ability for systems to, to listen to us more naturally. So of course, speech recognition is huge, uh, the ability for us to interact with computers in natural ways, and not just translate my words to text, but actually have a conversation with computers in a way that allows me to refine my conversations, just like we do as humans in the real world. And then, of course, gesture. So this ability for us to touch and, and interact with things, and again, in a more human way, not just using keyboards, not just using uh, mice, but using our whole bodies. The Kinect sensor from, from Microsoft on, on the Xbox One, for example, uh, is a great, great example of, of how you can almost look like Tom Cruise in Minority Report uh, by using your arms to, to move things all around your room. You look ridiculous while doing it. I'll be very clear. My daughter always uh, makes fun of me as I'm attempting to control the television with my body. Uh, but indeed, it's all there. So we have all these different mechanisms. We've given computing systems a brain. We've given them vision. We've given the ability to listen to us and interact with us. Uh, and we've given them the ability to uh, to engage with us in more natural ways. That's actually pretty exciting. We've built both uh, the human brain, or the, the digital brain, and digital senses. So really the contention, so thinking back for a second, we've got all this data that we're all in this room creating with all of our devices and all of our digital footprints that exist across the web. We've now got computing systems which are able to understand and make sense of that data and process it in a way that's, that makes it usable by uh, machines and by businesses. We've got systems that can understand us as humans more effectively, no longer have to necessarily talk to machines in their own language, which was the prerequisite 10 years ago if you were doing com uh, computing work. So suddenly now, we have this notion that machines and humans can work together. My, my kind of contention is that machines and machines, uh, the, the search, search technology, is the hinge between ma machine intelligence and what machines are good at and our own humanity. And if you think about what, make it very practical, in the, in the 90s, um, Deep Blue was IBM's big supercomputer, if you recall that back in the day. And Deep Blue was famous for beating Garry Kasparov, who was the grandmaster of chess, in a chess match. First time a computer had actually ever beat a human in chess. And of course, you know, I think Garry's a little bit upset because he got beat by a computer. I'm sure we'd all be, although these days I get beat by computers every single time I uh, plot my location to the nearest coffee shop, so I don't worry too much about it. But back then, it was a big thing to have, to have your intelligence supplanted by uh, computing. And rather than just storm off and be very angry, he actually stopped and went to IBM and said, what if we could work together? What if we could take my knowledge and my skill in the area and combine that with the uh, supercomputer Deep Blue? Well, what happened then? 
And lo and behold, as you can probably imagine, the combination of both of them, the combination of, of Gary's innate humanity and Deep Blue's amazing computational ability was more powerful than any other supercomputer and any other grandmaster on the planet. So my contention here is that it's not technology is going to replace us or technology is going to usurp us. It is this notion that technology will augment us. It will give us uh, superhuman capabilities in ways that we are just beginning to explore today. And that's what's so exciting about this new age of search is that it can, because of all the things we talked about, the increase of data, the increase in understanding, this ability for it to interact with us in natural ways, suddenly this search thing becomes a, an augmentation to our humanity. That's a very exciting, uh, I, I think, very exciting development in computer science. So what are the implications? So now that we've, if you kind of accept that, that thesis that uh, search will be the hinge between technology and humanity, what will happen? Well, the first thing is search is going to enhance reality fairly significantly. I guess this may be a screen cap from the Terminator movie. Probably not the best example uh, to not freak people out in the room, but it just, it, it's a metaphor. You get the idea. Don't worry about it too much. Uh, but this notion that search will radically enhance uh, reality. So if you have things like this, uh, this is Google, a, a shot from Google Glass, uh, rest in peace, Google Glass, it's no longer being sold. Uh, but this was actually a shot where you're standing somewhere uh, and, and you're looking at this object here in front of you, and on the right-hand side of your, of your vision, you see uh, the Bale Grist Mill. So it, li literally here, this, this system called Field Tripper was augmenting that which you were seeing all around you with local data. So it suddenly said, ah, you're standing right here, you're facing this direction, you're at this flat and long, I recognize this object, I, rec I recognize the, uh, the kind of characteristics of the object, I think that's what this is, the Belgris Mill, boom right there, search has, in essence, augmented your physical reality through a massive index in the back end. Very exciting stuff. Things like Estimo, for small business, for, low, for any kind of uh, physical commerce, very exciting technology. You can see them, how small they are. They can stick almost anywhere. They're a Bluetooth low energy beacon. You can place them all around your physical locations. And it allows you to do things like today, you know, track where folks are in your store. Or as people are walking by a certain, a certain object in your aisle or a certain object on the shelf, have a push notification to the device saying, hey, this is on sale or really cool, this would look really great with a thing you bought last week. Uh, if you're in a, in a store and you see a pair of shoes on the shelf, if the search systems eventually know enough about you, they'd be smart enough to recommend which things may go best with your wardrobe is a really, I think, fun and cool example. Uh, but it really is, uh, uh, the, again, search is powering this infusion of digital technology and physical technology in ways that we've never seen before. And these things are cheap. I mean, relatively speaking, they're cheap. Um, they can, and they can be put all across uh, physical locations to really bring that digital layer over the top of physical environments. I mentioned a bit uh, the Xbox One and the Kinect. This is not a promo for it, but it's an interesting, I think, uh, concept. Uh, this is an example of where the Kinect, yes, can help you interact with your Xbox and look like kind of a, a goof as you're doing that. Uh, but what's really exciting to me is the, is the sensors that it has inside of it. So for example, the Kinect can figure out your heart rate by looking at you across the room. It can see how much weight you're putting on your right leg as you're standing. It can measure all these variables without ever touching you. And begin to think about the implications of that. Suddenly now, today on Netflix, maybe you, you rate uh, a, a, something you like a lot, and you give it a four-star or five-star explicit rating, and that models then your future choices of what else you might want to watch. But imagine now if you're watching a show, and with your permission, of course, uh, Connect is, is there and actually analyzing how you're really responding to that show. So if I'm watching The Wire, for example, uh, you can see I'm getting really into it. My heart rate's up, I'm just, my pupils are focused, I'm not moving away from the screen. Suddenly those signals, uh, could allow a machine learning system to say, wow, he's really into the wire. I may, only, I, may, I may never rate it at all. I may rate it three stars for who knows why. But the systems themselves could be smart enough to figure out what I actually am doing, what I actually care about, uh, and then model my future choices. So the ability for us to have that amazing amount of collected data, data in ways that are very non-traditional really expand the art of the possible. This is this thing you can't see very well, but it's, it's a product called MindMeld, uh, and it's uh, out of the Bay Area. Uh, but these guys are able to listen into conversations, listen into, in this case, you use their application, you may have a four, a three, a, in this case, a four-way video chat, 
And it's listening to you as you're all having these conversations. So you're all talking about the upcoming trip to San Francisco this weekend. And as I'm talking, it's pulling out certain things, pulling out Sausalito, pulling out Stinson Beach, pulling out the ferry building, pulling out uh, uh, biking across Golden Gate Bridge. These are all utterances that are happening within the conversation. So as we're all talking, these utterances are being picked up. The objects of the utterances are being pulled out uh, and put up here. And then we're able to see uh, the systems making sense of those utterances. So the top one is a slanted door. Uh, it's a great Vietnamese restaurant in, in San Francisco. But suddenly the system says, aha, step into the slanted door. And here are a bunch of different things, whether it's reservations or pictures or websites about it, to help augment that conversation. This exists today. This is not science fiction. This you can go and install for $4, I think it is, on, on your iOS device right now. So those are really interesting ways, I think, that um, search can enhance the world around us. And for those in the local data space, for those in the, in the, in the local business space, and those in the physical commerce space generally, I think it's a very, very big deal because it's a, it's a big departure from what we've had uh, in the past. The second thing is search is going to enhance us. So we've talked a bit about how search will enhance reality, but search is going to enhance us as humans as well, uh, hopefully not turning us into cyborgs with very, very creepy eyes, but uh, uh, potentially, I'm down for that. Uh, so some, some interesting things that could happen. Uh, for example, this thing on the left, um, I'm just drawing a blank on the name of the product, honestly, uh, but it, it's something you wear around uh, your neck. I'm sure Chris may, may, have, may actually have this, but you wear it around your neck and as you're walking around your daily life, it's snapping a picture of everything. It's snapping a picture of uh, where I'm standing right now. As I walk back to the green room, it takes a picture of the, the room between these two rooms. It knows uh, the Latin long. It knows the temperature. It knows which direction I'm facing. It literally is capturing my entire life uh, in a given day. That, that, again, there's a lot of issues with this from a privacy standpoint for those who don't be photographed, all sorts of things. I'm just asking us for, for a moment to imagine the possibilities here of having your entire life digitized in a very implicit, not explicit, like checking in on Foursquare or posting something on Twitter, in a very implicit way. And then on the right-hand side, you see a product that my buddy over at MS Research built called Life Browser, which is able to take all these terabytes of data about you and let you remember things more effectively. So I can say, gosh, where was I speaking as last month? Uh, it was, I think it was in Denver. Uh, I can't think, of, and I, I know I had a meeting that, that afternoon I had to make. Though that kind of very lossy search technology or, term, or search terms can be pulled through in something like Live Browser to help you remember what it was, where you were, what you talked about, without having to be specific about what it is you actually are looking for. So very exciting, both from the digitization standpoint and, of course, the retrieval standpoint, uh, uh, if you collect this much data. Uh, this is a good example, too, of where, where search can, I'm not the best headline, but, but where search can, can radically affect how you even engage with media. So uh, great example. It, we've, we've, a lot of us have probably read about ISIS. We understand kind of the general gist of it. We understand where they are, what's happening, that kind of thing. But every single news story that you read about ISIS it says probably 50% of things you already know. That's a huge waste of time, and it actually is a very cognitive overload on, your, on, your, on, our, on our mammalian brains, which are not suited for as much information being thrown at us in a given day. So what's cool about search is that it can know what you've already read. Search can actually figure out what you've likely forgotten. We can apply a Bayesian model to look at all the things you've seen and, and attempt to figure out, well, oh, likely, given Stefan's patterns, he's forgotten exactly where I started, as an example. Uh, and so then what can happen is search can refactor the entire user experience to help you engage more effectively with that content. So rather than having to scroll through 95 articles, I can, only, I can look at 49. And of the 49, I can actually only read things that uh, maybe things that I otherwise would have forgotten. So very exciting ways where search can understand us as humans and attempt to model the world around us uh, more effectively. Things like Refresh, a very cool app, I think, as well. Uh, Refresh and Human, other applications, very, very cool. Uh, Refresh is this, uh, this, this app where it looks at my calendar, figures out who I'm meeting with in the next, you know, next day or the next hour, and builds dossiers on them. Might sound creepy again, but again, the notion is how do I how do I tap into the digital footprints of all the different people uh, across the planet? And how do I assemble some information? So with, with Refresh, for example, it'll actually say you're meeting with uh, Natasha here. Uh, she went to this university. Uh, she loves this sports team. Uh, you met with her last a month ago in D.C. about this topic, and it really helps augment my memory and augment my ability to connect with people because I'm able to to engage with them in a more personal level uh, in real time. And again, this is a shipping product today. Uh, no magic, this is all functioning right now and getting better, frankly, with every release. And really at the end of all this, really th th this is, it's exciting because 
uh, I want to be able to get to this point. Like, I want to be able to get to and search this level of uh, generic query. So I'm here in Denver, I've got to catch a flight in a couple hours, uh, and I forgot my charging cable for my phone. It's a big pain in the butt. Right? What happens today? Well, I panic, I ask everyone here, can I borrow your charger for a few hours, that kind of thing. In the future, what I want to be able to say to a search engine is, I need a cable for my phone. That's all I want to say. And what could happen is, and what will happen is, the search engine will say, well, know about me, it'll know what phone I'm on, it'll know where I'm at right now, it'll know my schedule, my calendar, et cetera, and it'll begin to build a task chain. It'll begin to build this, this ability for the system to look at the phone I'm using right now, uh, know what kind of cable is required for that. It can, it can look at my calendar, know I've got a flight at uh, 1 o'clock, I've got to get to, it knows where I'm at right now, obviously. Uh, it can then uh, figure out using all the different web services that exist out there, how, where the cable is, who has it in stock, and then it can dispatch a TaskRabbit to go and pick it up for me using their TaskRabbit API. So imagine here what could happen. I, I literally just say, I need a cable, and an hour later, someone comes in here with the cable from Best Buy that they purchased for me with my credit card that's on file with TaskRabbit, and it comes to my hand. It sounds like science fiction, but none of this is impossible today. All the APIs exist, all the SDKs exist for that, for that exact scenario to happen right now. And that's what can happen when, the, when, the, when we think about search differently and we think about the amount of data we're presented with different, differently. We no longer think about it as simply a retrieval of information, but how we can stitch together the world's information, the world's data about the physical world and make it actionable for those of us living inside that physical world. So what is the next, what does the near future search look like? Uh, well, this is a kind of a five, six things that I always think about when I'm looking at uh, how search has, has evolved and where it's going. The first thing is a search query won't be words necessarily. It'll, it will include any change in state. That change in state could be I woke up this morning in Denver. Uh, that change in state could be uh, I'm flying, uh, just, I just got back from, uh, from Africa, so I, I, I land from, from uh, Johannesburg uh, back in D.C. That's a change in state. It could be that's 6 o'clock. That's a change in state. All these things are, in essence, implicit search queries. They are queries that, uh, that happen without us saying anything, but are nonetheless queries. Search won't need to listen to what you say to know what you mean, meaning that, again, because search, again, with permission and privacy uh, being respected, a search can figure out what you really are asking or what you're really trying to get done versus you having to be as explicit as you are today when you're engaging with search engines. Uh, search will understand and take action in the real world rather than just observing it. We kind of mentioned that with the TaskRabbit example, with the cable example. But this ability for both the world to be modeled in great detail and all the services that exist today to connect dig digital and physical together, the combination of those two factors mean that search will be, able to, will be able to do things for us and with us, not just simply give us information. Search will appear when you need it and where you need it, even if you don't know you need it. Sounds kind of creepy, but it's not. It just means that search will no longer be something you have to go to. You don't have to go to Bing.com. You don't have to go to Google.com. You don't have to go to Yahoo.com. Search will be ambient. It will be everywhere. In every application you use, every interaction you have, this ability for search to exist will simply be there. Uh, search will contribute to human knowledge, not just simply index it. This is a great one. I'm very excited about this. Even uh, we bought a company a few years ago called Faircast, which was really good at building uh, models to figure out whether or not airline prices were going to go up or down for a given ticket. So you could say, should I buy the ticket to Denver uh, today? It'd say, don't buy it, because we think in the next four days it's going to go down 48%. So that's synthetic knowledge. That doesn't exist anywhere. That is an example of how we're able to take, in that case, over two billion different airline price points in a given day and stitch them together to give you some piece of knowledge which didn't exist before. So very exciting things there. And then finally, search is going to simplify our lives. It's going to do things we don't want to do, uh, helping us make better decisions and ultimately steering us away from actions that are not to our benefit. Uh, again, people, whenever I talk about this at dinner parties, you can imagine I'm very popular at dinner parties uh, these days. Uh, but when I, when I do talk about this kind of stuff, uh, people always say, but aren't you taking away free will? Aren't you kind of taking too much out of our hands? And there's a whole different talk we can go into uh, later on, on this notion of free will and how search can augment that. But I believe really what it means is that we're able to more effectively live our lives because search can handle the minutia of the stuff that we don't care about. The fact that I have to get from here to the airport, I don't know how long it's going to take. I have no idea how I'm going to do it. Well, I do, but uh, in theory, I don't have any idea how I'm going to do it. Uh, the fact that search can simply just say, hey, you know, in four minutes your car's arriving, you got to get out of here, and not me not have to think about that explicitly, that's a big deal. So this ability for us to free up a lot of the processing we have that we devote today to minutia and tasks and offload those things to a machine system that can work for us and augment our natural abilities to be more creative and be more fulfilled is really where I'm uh, most excited that search is going. 
Um, so with that, I'll kind of end it there. I'm almost out of time, so I will end it there. There are obviously a lot of questions, a lot of questions around privacy, around security, around how this all manifests, how you make money on it. Uh, all very valid questions. Uh, I'm not a book shiller, but part of it's in my book if you want to read it. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure you can get it for free somewhere. Uh, but generally, uh, <laughs> that, that is, uh, that is exactly where the, the next generation of search needs to go. Uh, all the constraints, uh, nonetheless, are still there. We have to work through the most technical people in this space. Uh, thank you very much. Have a great day.